Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. I want to invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to the book of Job, or excuse me, the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Go to the book of Psalms and turn right. You'll come to Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah. You keep going right. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. <clears throat> the Lord is good. I cannot wait till this evening. Pastor Matt Scott from the Gathering Place in Moody, Alabama will be here this evening. Come on, let's praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> Unusual. Um, unprecedented, high-caliber miracles, movements, encounters with God are happening. You'll remember I said last Sunday, and I want you to take a picture of this, and I, wanted to, I want you to put it on your phone or put it somewhere. If you will sustain this level of prayer, I will do this continuously. I've got this the other day. This was just July 3rd. 16-year-old daughter was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of leukemia and they got baptized in proxy because she was too weak to walk, let alone travel to get baptized. Some of you, now look at me, are connected to some very dire situations. You have addicts, Abusive sons and daughters, prodigals, cancer, running in someone's life that you know. I want you to know that God is not limited to proximity. He is able to move wherever faith moves him. Mm -hmm. I want to say that again. God is able to move wherever faith moves him. The centurion said, Lord, if you'll just speak the word, there's no need you to come into my house. And when he went home, he found his daughter well. So someone... got baptized in proxy because she was too weak to walk and let alone travel to get baptized. So the posture sometimes is this. Well, if the Lord wants her healed, he will heal her wherever she is. Yes and no. Yes, because God can do anything that he wants to do, but he's not moved by need. He's moved by faith. There are needs everywhere in the world God's not moving. And just because you and I have a need does not place the demand on God. There were needs all around, the wom uh, around Jesus as he was walking through the crowd, but it was the woman who pressed through the crowd. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, according to your faith. And sometimes we have a lazy disposition by saying, well, if the Lord wants her to be healed, there's no need for me to get them to the water. The posture and the mindset should be, wherever he is, I will go. And if the person I want to be touched can't get there, I will go on their behalf. Now, I'm just releasing something into you today. Because there's been this, in, in, in the body, just this approach that, well, the Lord will do whatever he wants to do. Yeah, he can, but he oftentimes doesn't. He does what his people pull from him and, 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 and release. Mm. I don't know if you're catching, anybody catching that this morning? 
So while you're here or you know someone and they're dying at home, well, your prayer could be, Lord, touch so and so. Well, the Lord says, I, okay, I need you to, I want you to do something. So the next slide, between the time of her parents' baptism and today, July 29, 2022, there were several accounts of miracles along the way that had her full healing, that her full healing was coming to pass. For example, they were going to have to operate on her blood clots because they were so aggressive, but she woke up the next morning and all the blood clots were gone after people gathered. And There's just so much that I need to unpack right there. It hadn't happened prior to that, even though she was sick prior to that and probably cried out for that to happen. But it was her parents, if I'm reading that correctly, that stepped out on her behalf. And then after people gathered around her and prayed. Thank God for people that will gather to pray. Mm -hmm. Some of you work with people that are so far from God. May the burden of the Lord come upon you for their lost soul and that you will get as baptized as many times as you need to, not for yourself, but for the releasing an act of faith to those until you see the hard heart crumble right before your very eyes. My Lord, I feel it. Blood clots were gone after the people gathered and prayed. It gets better. She was getting blood work done to prepare for her upcoming bone marrow transplant. The lab test came back and there is zero trace of leukemia. I've already, I've, I've seen too much to believe in coincidences anymore. I've not seen dozens or hundreds, but I've seen thousands of these, thousands of these, thousands of these. And no, listen, no person gets any of the credit. There's no name on there. She was getting blood work done to prepare for her upcoming bone marrow transplant. The lab test came back and there is zero trace of leukemia in her bone marrow and blood cells. She's got the definite miracle. She got the definite miracle July 29, 2022, 25 days after her parents stood in for her while people did not cease praying. Yes. You may be seated in the house. Feel his presence. If you will sustain this level of prayer, I will do this continuously. Karen and I were riding down the road yesterday and she said, Todd, there seems to be a, a shift of where there are more miracles. The, I don't know the exact way you put it to me, Karen, but it was like more people are getting healed than those that are not. Hmm, that was the way you said it. More people are getting healed than those that are not. It used to be the other way around, more people coming in and not getting healed and a few getting touched. But now it seems to have been reversed because if you will sustain this level of prayer, Jesus spoke to me in that hotel room in Ohio and he said, I'll do this continuously. Somebody giving praise right now. Yep. We are right now in, in the fulfillment of this. I'm gonna shake this place like it's never been shaken before. We are right there right now. Blessed be his holy name. I want to preach a message out of the book of Joel that is entitled Weeping Between the Porch and the Altar. Weeping Between the Porch and the Altar. Weeping Between the Porch and the Altar. I love what Reinhard Bonnke said. He's now with the Lord, one of the most fabulous evangelists that had ever walked the planet. Uh, I, I love that he made this statement. I want you to write this down. 
He says, I don't want to play with marbles when God told me to move mountains. The day of playing with marbles are over, to the, are over in the church. Things have shifted in the spirit realm. Things have moved. Things are continuing to move. I want you to look at Joel chapter two, verse one. The Bible says in verse one, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. But all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. There's a great trembling coming to the body. Verse 12, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger it, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Verse 17, let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Father, I thank you for your reading of the word. Thank you, Lord, that you are in this place. Thank you, God, that you're going to move in our hearts, our spirits, our lives today, and we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. I follow a few preachers. I don't listen to a lot of preachers, but I do listen to some. And one of my favorite preachers is still alive today at 96 years of age. And it's not a man, it's a woman. I heard this lady preach many years ago, and to this day, I do not know that there is a man that can out-preach her. Her name is Vesta Mangum. Her son pastored the Pentecostals of Alexandria in Alexandria, Louisiana, a great, phenomenal church. I will turn her on and I will watch this 96-year-old woman preach as if she's a 22-year-old lady. Here's what she said, if you need a visual. She said, great revival always begins in the hearts of a few men and women upon whose hearts God lays a burden from which no rest can be found except in desperate crying unto God for an endowment of power from on high that comes through prayer, more prayer, better prayer, fasting prayer, and sleepless prayer. I do not believe that that statement could be more fitting in for which the hour in which you and I live. If we are honest, most of praying that happens in the church is asking for things from God to meet particular needs, perhaps even a wish list. I am here today helping us change the posture. Our heart has to change. I listened to her the other day and she said, when I die, <laughs> don't you love it, 96 years old? When I die, not that I'm going to die, but when I die sometime in the future, probably at 110 still preaching, she says, I want the Lord to come for me while I am praying in tongues. Can you imagine no sweeter, no sweeter posture than to be laying on your back after a great meal, <laughs> kissing your spouse good night, and, and you're lying in bed and you just simply talk to the Lord, praying in the Holy Ghost, and then he comes for you. It is this right here 
that changes communities, but before communities, churches, but before churches, people's hearts. No revival can be bought. No revival can sustain itself based upon talent, giftings, even anointings. Anointings come, anointings go. The only thing that sustains a move of God of which where we see continuously an outpouring of God where people are saved, healed, and delivered is through prayer. And I love the way she put it. More prayer, better prayer, fasting prayer, and sleepless prayer. I walked a few moments ago out of the prayer meeting that we had at nine o'clock. Someone came and got me and said, something's happening in the children's room. Can you come and see? There's a generation being raised up. Now listen to me, yeah, 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 yeah. There is a generation that is being raised up in our very presence that are understanding the most important thing that a church does is not entertain them or turn somersaults in trying to keep them and presenting to them such wow that they don't want to miss church. That's fluff and stuff. And it's nothing more than sugar. But there is a generation that God has raised up in not only this house, but other houses where children are turning to seek God and learn the value of prayer they take their shoes off to walk into a room to pray and to seek God. These are unprecedented moments. That parents... Do not miss the moment that you have afforded to you to raise your children in a move of God. They will not grow an appetite for God away from God. Hmm. That picture's worth a thousand words. Parents, do you recognize your children's shoes? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean... <laughs> blessed be his holy name I said blessed be his holy name the question was asked of a person that attended the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 and 
and they asked the question in your judgment, what was the outstanding spiritual phenomenon of the Azusa Street Revival? Now listen to this. This, this, is, this is profound. What, what, what was the most profound, outstanding spiritual phenomenon? The reply is this. Now listen to this. Without question, in my own judgment, from the spiritual standpoint, it can be answered in one word, tears. The question was asked in your judgment, what was the outstanding spiritual phenomenon of the Azusa Street Revival? I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I don't know if you've ever let that, you know, because we're quick to talk about the miracles. We're quick to talk about the trances. We're quick to talk about what God did in, in Los Angeles and, and with all the personalities. But one witness said, the most spiritual phenomenon I saw was tears. He said, I've been a Christian since boyhood and my observation has been that hardness of heart is probably, mm, hardness of heart is probably the greatest single obstacle and hindrance to revival. You see, it is even possible in the midst of a move of God like this to grow a hard heart, to become callous because you have seen some things and witnessed some things and now you know some people that you've been doing life with two to three years and maybe four years and, and it, is very, it, it is easy in the move of God to grow a hard heart. Not stimulated, not overexcited, not motivated and now things become a duty and a chore He continued, listen to this, look at it on the screen. The Azusa Street Revival began where every revival should begin in repentant tears. The revival began in tears, it lived in tears, and when the tears ended, the Azusa Street Revival ended. I remember the sweetness of the Holy Ghost. And he is here today in that same, that same, that same sentiment. He is here, pulling us, drawing us to a place of weeping and repentance. Yeah, yeah. The book of Joel, quickly as I look here, I want you to notice a few things. The hour was beyond critical for the children of Israel at this time. Literally, they were on the verge of God's judgment. You can find it in Joel 1, Joel 2, and, and, and beyond. And they all knew that this incredible, intense suffering was just over the hill, if you will. And the judgment that was coming to them was justified. There's no question about that. It was justified, but God... God had another plan. Everybody say, God had another plan. And so God instructed uh, the prophet. He said to them, I want you to relay a very specific instruction to the priest. And here's what it was. Do you really want to hear it? Here's what I want you to do. I don't, I don't want the priest to say anything. He said, I just need him to pray. I don't need the priest to preach. I need the priest to pray. Do you hear what I'm saying? He says it in verse 17. He says, between the temple porch and the altar, let the priest, ministers of the Lord, weep and say, have pity upon your people and do not make your heritage a disgrace or a mockery among the nations. Don't deliver another sermon. Don't do another conference. Simply pray. We feel in America that we can preach our way out of it. We have literally preached ourselves into this mess. We feel that we can worship our way out of it. We have worshiped ourselves into this mess. 
And the one thing, the staple of the church that we have neglected above all things across the body of Christ at large is the prayer element. And it is the most important. He says something here that's interesting. Look at verse 17. He says, I want the priest, look at it, verse 17. Let the priest who minister weep between the porch and the altar. Now, this is interesting because the porch was located in the temple at the front of the sanctuary. Come on, Caneo students. And people were able to gather from that position in order to witness the intensity of the scenes that were unfolding on the altar. Now watch this, very important. The people could clearly see from this vantage point, the people, the commoners, if you will, could see, the people of Israel could see that the priests were going to be weeping and bringing great intercession for the people that they loved. And so here they are on the porch. And not only could they see where the priests were weeping, but they could also see the altar of where there were great sacrifices. And God says, I want the people of God to stand between the porch and the altar and say nothing but weep and pray. You see, the altar was the area within the temple that we all know and that we have all learned about and, and studied that this is where the sacrificial offerings were made to the Lord and the descent of that burning flesh ascended before the Lord. Do you hear me? So on the altar, death and fire reigned there. Now you can only imagine, you can only imagine the people of Israel Instructed by God, I want you to come to the porch and I want you to look through and I want you to see what is transpiring here. And I want you to see, now listen to this, the fire and I want you to see the sacrifice being made. Can you imagine the horror of that moment? Where sheep would come. And the priests would take a knife and they're lined up. Sacrifices are made on behalf of the people to the Lord. The bellowing, the fear, the anxiety of the animals. They sense fear. They can smell it. And can you imagine the sounds at the altar when there's fire and there's heat and a priest takes a knife and slits the throat and the carnage of a dead carcass on the floor as they begin to take out the entrails and blood is everywhere, all over the place, everywhere. And the crowd, the children, the moms and the dads are all watching and they're seeing this take place. fire and the smell of burning flesh and God told the priest don't say anything judgment is coming I just simply need you to go in between them and weep and pray do you feel his presence the space in between is my favorite space It's an intersection, if you will, in the temple. It became a place of intercession and agony for the souls of the children of Israel, a place of travail, a place of anguish, if you will. And God told them strategically place yourselves there between the altar, the place of death, and the place of life. He says, I need you to weep and I need you to wail for the people. Church, where am I going with this this morning? I feel very strongly by the Holy Ghost. Even though we have touched the tip, even though we have seen a thing or two, even though that we have watched with our very own eyes miracles that could be penned in the book of Acts, 
We have watched lame people walk. We have watched blind eyes open. We have watched as deaf ears were made to hear. We have seen cancer dissipate. We have seen leukemia retreat as if in terror. We have watched prodigals come home. We've watched marriages get reconciled. We have watched nearly every miracle that could possibly be known to man happen in this house. And I release to you today that this is nothing more, as glorious as as it is, the tip of what God wants to do. (laughs) There will come a new frontier of this revival. It will be spontaneous salvations. There will come such a glow around the building that is not connected to any individual or any people. However, it will be such a glow around the building that people will begin to drive by and wonder, is there a building on fire? Why is the sky lighting up the way it is? At times, it will have different hues to it. It will, it will be blue at certain times. And then at times, it will be like just white, just literally like fluorescent lights uh, just coming off of our building. But then there will be times that it is yellow, it is red, it is green. I, I don't know, but God is a God of color. He's creative. I mean, why did he put all the colors in the rainbow the way he did? Why did he make the grass green? Why did he make the sky blue? Why does he, you understand, God is a God of vast array and expanse. But there is coming a time, and I believe uh, uh, that, that it, is, it is upon us very closely. We're right there at the threshold that, that people, there will be this spontaneous salvations of where people will say, what is going on? I see something that is happening in the sky, and, and it won't be just a sunset. It won't be just a, a cloud. It will be something Deeper than that. It will be something more mystical and spiritual than that. It will will be like the glory of God resonating on the place. And and from whatever vantage point you look at it, it could be that color. Or you come over here, it's a different color. It is absolutely moving and evolving as we even speak. I know you believe me. That is not for a sign for us. And, and people say, well, what are you talking about? That's kind of weird. That's kind of, that's kind of, no, 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 no. You see, Moses went to the mountain of God and he, he went to the, to the face of God and he talked with God face to face as if with a friend. And the Bible says that he was covered with such glory of the Lord, that such magnificent light that people said, Moses, you got to cover your head. If he can cause a burning bush to burn and not be consumed, God can make anything happen in the heavenlies that he desires to happen. Come on now, talk to me. And so when I, when I say spontaneous conversions, people will drive by and all of a sudden they'll begin, they'll, they'll have a bag with them. They'll, they'll, have, they'll have their weed with them. They'll have their liquor with them. They'll have a person that they're not supposed to be with with them. And all of a sudden they're, they're, just, they're just mesmerized by what God is doing in the heavenlies. And they say, I don't know, but I got to go check that out. And the closer they get to the building, the closer they get to the... The epicenter of the glory of God, their heart begins to melt before the presence of the Lord, and they begin to say, I don't know why, but I can't go home with you. I can't sleep with you tonight. I can't smoke this weed tonight. I can't do this drug tonight. There will be reports. We'll begin to receive them. The people will pull their cars over. And we may never hear the fullness of it. They'll pull their cars over and say, I don't know why, but I feel that I have to get right with God. That's it. Last night in prayer, I don't know, it was probably one of the most magnificent times of prayer that we've ever had. Close to 200 people gathered in this room on a Saturday night. presence of the Lord was in this room. I'm sitting there and I hear the Lord speak to me. He says, Todd, there will come a time that when my glory is so strong 
that there will be miracles that will take place just where, just where people are sitting. They're just going to be in the atmosphere of the glory of God. They're going to be in the presence that, that is so thick, so pure, untainted, that, that literally husbands who have not slept with their wives, their wives have not slept with their husband for weeks and perhaps months because they're mad at one another, all of a sudden because of the glory of God, he will reach over and touch her hand and say, I don't know why, I need you to forgive me and I am so sorry. And the water will not only come a point of contact for miracles, but there will be miracles that take place that get consummated in the water. Whew. Feel his presence. People will be sitting in their chairs and they'll go, it's not there. It's not there. The lump is not there. So in the middle of praise and worship, they'll run to the bathroom to take the clothes off and look in the mirror and say, push in the skin. The lump used to be, I, I was able to see it. I was able to see it. I can't see it. I can't feel it. Come on, I wish somebody would believe God with me today. I, I feel like I'm talking to a bunch of Baptists in the room that said, I don't know if that's real or not. I, I, are there any Pentecostals in the house today? The charismatics that believe that. You'll be sitting in the house of God and you'll be consistent in prayer time. Now you have to understand, you have to understand in and out of prayer, in and out of prayer, in and out of, you know, once every three or four weeks. Guys, listen, it cannot sustain the move of God. Nor will it break out in your own home. That right there we saw on the screen is a result of years, years of not giving up and setting the example to our young people. And our children. Get used to this, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles. You're concerned and burdened about someone that's away from God, but you have been pouring your heart out at these altars. Now watch this, not at home, not at home, not at home. He didn't tell the priest to go home and pray. He says, I need you to stand between the altar and the porch. Can you be heard at home? Absolutely, we can be heard at home, but there's something about the corporate prayer meeting. There are over 13 corporate prayer meetings in the book of Acts. There's something about sacrificing to come one day a week to pray for an hour. Even though we pray five times, now we're up to seven because our young people pray on Wednesday nights. Our children are praying on Sunday morning. There are seven individual prayer meetings happening all across the campus. Come on, give him glory. So here's what you got to get used to. Here's what you got to get used to. You're going to be, you're going to have to get used to this because we're going to live in the now. We're going to live in the spontaneous combustion of the Holy Ghost, that there's not going to be a prayer. And then three years down the road, we're going to see the answer to the prayer that may happen. But listen, the timeline is shrinking. I'm telling you the, 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 the timeline of the Lord is shrinking. We're going to pray because we are in such favor with God, because we are constantly in his presence, seeking his face, beholding his glory, that whatever we ask now in the natural will manifest it within a few moments. My Lord, I feel that. I'm gonna say it again. We're gonna be so, so consistent in our corporate prayer meetings, so intense, so focused, so driven, so enamored and enraptured with his heart toward lost people that we're gonna be in a group of folks and we're going to say, my son is away from God. My daughter is not saved. Will you get in agreement with me? You gather here at the altar where two or three of us are gathered in his name. He's right there where two of us agree as touching any one thing. Whatsoever we ask, the Father shall be done. And we are interceding before God. And as we are praying... He walks into the room. She walks into the room. Hey, I believe it, Lord God. I believe it. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Make it so, God. Whew. 
Thank you, Holy Ghost. We have to learn to be disciplined and committed, and hear what I'm about to say, to the in-between place. Literally the place between the living and the dead. Aaron was instructed by Moses and he said, I need you to do something as the plague was spreading and destroying people. He, says, he said to Aaron, and he, he said, I need you to go. And he says, I need you to take this and I need you to stand between the living and the dead. Living in the dead. I, Aaron, I need you to go to the altar and I need you to grab the fire and I need you to stand between the living and the dead. Let me tell you what God is looking for. He is not looking for another swagger-like church that is the most hip church that is ministering to gener uh, Generation Z, Gen Z, and the millennials, and they try to swagger themselves into influence. We do not need another church plant that somehow, somewhere in a prayer closet, a dude gets the revelation, well, I'm going to begin to do church differently. And so they'll pop something up and they'll have a launch and they'll have two to 300 people and, and, and you don't know if you're in a church or not. The only way that you know that you're in a church is some of the songs that they sing. Preacher gets up and it's a spiritual TED talk. Let me help you become a better you. We do not need a whole, listen to this, we do not need new guys and new women planting new churches. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Because we have enough churches that are dead and dying, we need somebody to find these dead and dying churches, step inside of them, and not preach yourself into revival, not preach yourself into a move of God, not swagger yourself into influence, but literally set the example. Here's how they did it in the book of Acts. I'm going to lay on this altar, and I'm going to cry, and I'm going to repent, and I'm going to be broken until God comes and God changes this wicked heart of mine and then when I stand up to preach, I've got something to say. I have got something to deliver. I bring kingdom to you. No, we're producing models all around how to, how to arrange your chairs so it's not intimidating and trigger people. I digress. Do you hear what I'm saying? I need some people to join me between the living and the dead. I cried out last night. I said, oh God, I want so much of your glory in my life. That I, that I don't want to be able to stand. I said, God, would you put as much weight of me, weight of you on me as my physical body can handle? Lord, to the point of collapse, if necessary, and even to the brink of obliteration of my physical body. I have tasted and I have seen what the kingdom of God looks like in this room with you, this army, these people. People said it couldn't be done. People said they won't make it. I'm with a pastor in Texas one day. He says, I don't even pray for revival. I don't want revival. He says, I've watched what it does to churches, how it destroys churches. He said, I don't want revival. He 
Think of that for a moment, what he just said. I don't want revival because every church I've ever been in that had revival, church is split. Because people make it, they get angry, they get upset, they get tired, they get weary, they get frustrated, they, they feel they're missing life. And they start yakking with one another, pulling out, withdrawing. He said, I just want a safe move of God. I just, I, just want it, I just want it to be, I just want him to move. And my heart broke for that pastor. But here's where I am. I know how fragile I am. And I know how fragile you are. I know I'm one decision from half of you leaving this room. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Hire the right person, hire the wrong person. Let go of the right person or let go of the wrong person. And everything that you witnessed and watched for the last four years matters not. I've been in this 30 years. I know when it gets stale to you, you start looking elsewhere. But nobody has changed. Do you hear what I'm saying? We do our routine every week, every day, what we did four years ago, but more. I don't talk to people, hardly. I'm, I'm getting, um, crowds bother me. And here's the reason why. Because I can say one word to you that you receive the wrong way and you pull out. So I just don't do that. I isolate myself. I get up in the morning, I have coffee with my wife at Starbucks. I go to the office or I travel. On Wednesday, I'm here. I pick her up to go to Starbucks. I go to bed. I get up and I catch a flight. On Saturday, I'm with no one but my wife. And all night or all day, I look for Saturday night at six o'clock. And I pray. I don't go eat with anybody. I go home and I do it again for Sunday. Because... I know how fragile I am and you are. I live with the fear and the horror and the weight of one decision, one decision of a move of God being over. I guard my eyes. I guard who I'm in the room with. I guard what I say. And I even guard what I put on Facebook because I wanted to say some things to some people. Amen. Now watch this. Now, now I've not, people say, well, you changed. I hope I've died more. And that's the only change that you see. Now, if you, if you back me in a corner, I've been saved, but there's still some unsaved particles in my body, I'm sure. And when push comes to shove and I have to make a decision knowing that 50% of our people may not understand it, somebody's got to make that decision. And I know, I've seen it. I've been in this thing 30 years. I pray with your mother before she dies. I bury your mother held her hand, came home from vacation. 
but because we changed something, you need a new show. So I don't give my heart to people. I don't. I love you. I'll die for you. I'll fight for you. But I don't give my heart to you. Well, I want a pastor that gives me his heart. Well, that's why only 10% of us make it to the end. 90% of all pastors quit. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just being real with you right now. So you don't need me to be your friend. I want to be your friend. I like being your friend, and I want you to be my friend, but we're not going to be best friends. <laughs> Boy, I have come off the rails in a big way, haven't I, Abel? All right. <laughs> All right, I've got friends, all right? I've got one. <laughs> and, and that would be a stretch. Well, isn't it lonely? No, it's not. It's not. I'm safe. Safe. Bishop's my friend. So where am I going? I'm going, you need me here. You need me right here. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is where you need me. This is where I need to be. This is where I need to be. I'll do anything at any time. You guys know that. You call me. But I need to be here. Right there. Nose down. Trying to hear the voice of God. Weeping and wailing for your family and for this community. That's where preachers and men of God need to be. And women of the Lord, right there. You see, I close with this. In the book of Acts, they tried to get Peter and John to be friends with everybody. Take care of the widows. You got to come and take care of the widows. Legitimate need. Here's what Peter said. I will not leave the word to wait on tables. We are going to give ourselves to the word and to prayer. But he had a plan. Therefore, now choose among you people that can take care of. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So today, I'm going to go home and take a nap. <laughs> Hour and 20 minutes, I'll get up, come to a 430 pre production meeting, and come in here and pray. Because I know that's walking through those doors tonight are people that have days to live. They're one more heroin trip away from never breathing another breath on this planet. So I cannot concern myself with needs that are able to be met by others. Everything shifted four years ago. Y'all know that in our world, and you've been so gracious to let me sail in that direction. But the weight is enormous to know at any moment the fire can pull off the water if I refuse to keep pushing our people to seek his face. So on behalf of them, we sacrifice. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I heard the story about a pastor. His name was Hugh Price Hughes. This is what happened. 
At one point, he was the leading voice of the Methodist Church. Everybody say, thank God for the Methodists. When he would come back on a Sunday night from a preaching trip, he had come home, and if nobody had been saved, they said he was inconsolable, irate. Said you couldn't comfort him. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink, and he wouldn't even take his coat off. But he'd run to his bedroom and throw himself over his bed, and he would begin to sob. And he'd say, oh, God, why? God, why not tonight? Why didn't somebody get saved tonight? Why didn't somebody come to you tonight, oh God, why? And he just keep asking the question, why, why, why? Can you imagine if the burden in this house was spread equally across from front to back, from side to side? That if no one got saved, we'd say, you know what? We're not gonna go to Applebee's for dinner today, but we're gonna find out why. We're going to come to the altar and cry. So we do not want another barren Sunday or a barren day. I long for men and women to throw themselves across the bed and say, oh God, why? Why didn't anybody get healed today? Why didn't somebody get born again today? God says, stand, Todd. He said, Todd, stand between your people and the death and weep and well. Father, would you give us the ability to disconnect from our world of concern, our schedules, our practices, our deadlines, and become true spiritual to feel your heart, to connect with you, oh God. But oh God, today, may we be rejuvenated. Yeah. The fight, the good fight. To not grow weary and well do. Not take our hand off. Who in this room, head bowed, eye closed? You've never been born again. You've never been born again. I'm not saying that you prayed a prayer. I'm saying you never truly followed him, made a commitment to make Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord, to become his disciple. I'm not asking you if you had your sins forgiven. I'm asking you, have you decided to follow him? It's not about just your sins being forgiven. It's about being a disciple. If you've never ever made that commitment, then you're not born again. He's not just interested in forgiving sin. It's a part of it. But transforming your life so that you become a son and daughter of God to follow him. He is your father. That's never happened in your world. You've never been born again. You've never been saved You've never had that encounter. When I count three, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can. Ready? One, two, three. Anybody in the room? Anybody in the room? Raise it so I can see it. I see it. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm just looking around. Anybody else? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Anybody else? Okay. If your hand is up, make eye contact with me. Everybody else, your head is bowed. But if you raised your hand, make eye contact with me. Okay. I see it right there. Anybody else? If that's you, Karen, would you stand right here? 
If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come boldly right now. I'm not going to apologize about it. I'm not going to try to talk you. I'm, I'm saying come right now. If you just raised your hand and gave your life and you're ready to give your life to God, come right now. Come right now. Come right now. I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, come on. Come on. Yep. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. All right. We're going to take care of her. We're going to minister to her. We're going to lead her to the Lord. I want to ask you a question. You do understand what you're doing that you made that 70 foot walk front to here, from back there to here. That the old you is never, ever, ever going to be allowed back into your life. Okay? Not only because of what Jesus does, but because of the choice you're about to make. So, are you willing to repent? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, before you say yeah, I want to, are you willing to, don't say anything, repent. By that I mean, if you're living with a lover and having sex with someone that is not your husband, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to walk right back to your chair. Are you willing to so come to Jesus and say, Jesus, from this point on, I am going to serve and honor you. And I will not sleep, and I'm just using an example, sleep with him again, because that is inappropriate and not fitting for a child of God. And I am now yours. If there are drugs in your refrigerator, alcohol, liquor, weed, whatever it is, making that wall from there to here, you're saying to, to me and to everyone here that I am turning my back on that, and from this day forward, it will never touch my lips and enter my body again. So the tongue that you have in your body has been used to vulgarity, curse words. But today you're coming to the Lord and saying to him, Lord, this mouth will not spew bitter and sweet water. But from this point forward, my mouth is yours. Okay. At any point between now and the next 30 seconds that you're willing to say, I'm not quite ready for that, I'm okay with that. Are you okay? Are you, are you willing to die right here and give your life to God. Let's pray. Get on the floor. Say this. Say, Jesus, I give all of me to you. I turn my back on sin. All of it. And I give you my body, my life. I repent and I turn to you. Save me now. I'm your disciple, your daughter, and I choose you. May your blood run through my veins. And give me your DNA. <clears throat> come, Holy Spirit. Say, say, come, Holy Spirit. Fill me now. Jesus. There are others in this room that you just prayed that prayer. Come. If that was you, you come right now. If that was you.
there are others. There are others. Come on. All across the room, lift your voices to the Lord. Pray for your prodigal right now, Mom. I feel that. Pray for your brother that's away from God. Pray for your, your mother, your father. God's doing his thing at the front. We're going to minister to them tonight at five o'clock. Come join us for prayer. Stand between the living and the dead tonight. Father, we bless your people. Thank you for what you're doing, how you're moving. Be with Pastor Marty as he's ministering in Texas right now. Lord Jesus, blessing. We love you. As they're ministering to these at the front, let's just give the Lord one more hand clap of praise, would you? Oh, blessed be his holy name. Blessed be his holy name. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed. I'll see you tonight at 5 o'clock. Don't miss our revival.